Hi to everyone who's um, starting to join us. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. So thank you for sharing time with us this evening. Again, welcome to everyone who's logging on. We'll start in just a couple of minutes. And we're so happy you can be with us this evening. And I know you can't see it, but it's really fun to watch the numbers go up as people log on. Hans, can you see that also? Or maybe it's just me. I don't need to see that. That way I'll remain calm. <laughs> I'm not sure I will, but it's your presentation. So <laughs> I'm not too worried. Yeah, it's really fun. We had a really good response. So I think there's a lot of people who are very interested in this underwater history, which is, it's just so cool. I, I caught the bug years ago and couldn't shake it. So yeah. 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 I won't share all the things I heard when you were Hans was participating in a in a talk story a few weeks ago with one of our interns and your your life path was certainly interesting so you, you don't always end up where you think you are but sometimes it's better than you could have imagined right <laughs> yeah i think so i think so uh, yeah that's really cool to be a historian and archaeologist at all but yeah i i love it yeah that's the most important thing so that's really inspiring so again, welcome. There's a lot more people logging on right now and we're just so happy you can be with us and it's really fun to be able to share this with so many people who, you know, probably just couldn't join us if this was a live event in person. So we are really excited to share this history and we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. I'll wait a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. That is something of the silver lining of this current situation is the fact that we're all better at remote collaboration. And in mm -hmm. ways, I'm, I'm closer with some people in my office now than I was when we were going to our offices. Obviously. Yeah, that is so interesting. I feel that way too. I really do. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just in a totally different world right now. And it's, we have to, uh, we have to be resilient and find new ways to connect. And this is just such a, you know, a great thing to have Zoom and to have platforms like this. Yeah, this is a good use for the platform. It really is. It, it certainly is. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, get started in just a minute with a little introductions. And then I'll introduce our speaker and then we'll get started. Just taking care of a little bit of housekeeping behind the scenes right now. Thanks for your patience. Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started. I feel like there's going to be um, a lot more people joining us in the next few minutes, but I just want to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for attending this evening. My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. And tonight's event is Shipwrecks and Seafaring Stories of Hawaii's Past, just to make sure you're in the right place. Before introducing our speaker, uh, I just want to share a couple of virtual housekeeping items. So yes, today's presentation is being recorded. It's being recorded both on Zoom and actually it's streaming live right now on the Historic Hawaii Foundation YouTube channel and it will be saved there. So you can be there as well and share it. And I'll also be posting the video replay on the event page on our website. 
Um, if you have questions for the presenter during the talk, um, please type them in the Q&A box on the Zoom menu bar, which you can find, I believe it's on everyone, it's on the bottom. And um, our speaker has graciously agreed to pause periodically, and if not, I'll be gently interrupting him periodically during the talk to respond to questions. So it'll be a little different for those who joined us at our past events where all of the questions were at the end, but we'll be doing different stories, of uh, historical stories, and we'll try to pause in between each one, maybe just to see if there's questions. And if we have extra time at the end, we'll answer additional questions that we didn't get to. For those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places, sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. I'd now like to introduce and extend a warm welcome to today's speaker. Hans von Tilburg was originally introduced to the ocean on board his father's sloop Brunhilde at the age of eight and started to dive at the age of 11 in 1972. He has a master's degree from East Carolina University's Maritime Archaeology Program and earned a PhD in history at the University of Hawaii Manoa while running the certificate program in maritime archaeology. Hans has taught numerous university courses in maritime history, edited readers and proceedings, authored reports, contributed chapters, and published over 30 articles and book reviews, as well as several books. He has served as a consultant for UNESCO's Intangible Cultural Heritage Program, as well as co-instructor for UNESCO's Underwater Cultural Heritage Foundation courses in Thailand and Jamaica and St. Eustatius. He is currently the Maritime Heritage Coordinator Pacific Islands Region for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries in Hawaii. We hope you enjoy his presentation and we're very grateful he could share with you this evening. Hans. Thank you, it's thank you. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here and, and thank you to Historic Hawaii Foundation as well. Uh, it's fun for me and, and I do want to say that I, I actually didn't have any idea that I would have ended up being a historian and archaeologist. I was a carpenter for years and years, but I took a course in maritime archaeology and I caught the history bug. And there are some amazing stories that are told by the things that are discovered underwater. So that is the focus of this presentation, stories based on the wrecks that we find today and, uh, and you know, what they can tell us about our past behavior. Saying that, I do have to mention that since my talk is centered on Hawaii, that there are many stories from a much more ancient past that would really be the proper subject for another presentation at another time. This was the original discovery and settlement of the Hawaiian Islands, of course, by Pacific voyaging vessels like double-hulled canoes, or in this case, the Hokulea, the replica seen here. Amazing voyages from generations and generations past. But since we're telling stories based on shipwrecks, these are not included because these advanced vessels did not sink. So that's kind of a nice attribute to have for a sailing vessel. But we need to remember in the Pacific and Hawaii that that story of the original discovery is the boldest maritime migration in history. And here you can see the general outlines of that voyaging from East Asia through Southeast Asia, the Polynesian, the voyaging canoes out to the heartland of Polynesia here in central Oceania, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and in the last pulses of exploration to the ends of the Polynesian Triangle from Tahiti and Tuamotu to Hawaii and Rapa Nui and Aotearoa. Um, and at these times, you know, in these, the, the Vikings were barely venturing into the Atlantic, very, barely crawling away from the Scandinavian islands. So this was truly a of an amazing maritime migration. But our tales today, based on shipwrecks out here in the middle of the Pacific, begins in the early 1800s. 
when the Western vessels, which do sink, fortunately for us archaeologists, uh, began to come out in substantial numbers. And here you can see the lists of the known shipwrecks of whaling vessels from France and England and uh, Nantucket that were on global voyages, really. The numbers of these vessels lost in the main Hawaiian Islands here, the numbers lost in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the atolls to the northwest that extend from the Hawaiian Islands, and of course, many others lost throughout the Pacific, really. This was a hazardous, hazardous occupation. Uh, these were, you know, older wooden sailing vessels, often hardworking vessels, hardworking crews of whalers um, on voyages of two, three, four years or more to remote and basically uncharted vast ocean. Why would people do that? Why would they pursue this dangerous occupation? Because of the oil. It was, you can think of it in terms of being our first oil industry, really. The oil for lubrication and lighting uh, needed for America and for Europe and for money. When these vessels wreck, there's often not much left of the wooden structure itself, but what's left over over time is the metal bits, the anchors, the cannon, the tripods, the iron tripods you can see here that were used to boil out the whale blubber, boil out the oil, process it on board. A pretty hazardous occupation for a greasy wooden, wooden vessel out at sea. Uh, and here is the site of one of the two oldest known shipwrecks in Hawaii, oldest discovered shipwrecks in Hawaii, the British whaler Pearl, lost at Pearl and Hermes Atoll in 1822. And in fact, beneath this sand channel is the wooden keel of the vessel preserved underneath the sand. The rest of the wood has deteriorated and vanished and all the heavy pieces have fallen through the hull and end up on the reef. And they're quite deteriorated over the hundreds of years, 182 years or so that it's been in this high energy environment. Anchors, cannonballs, lead shot, fasteners, tools, bricks, grinding wheels, all of it is there. And the tripods, of course, to boil that oil out. The voyages that these whalers were on to the Pacific were rather astounding. This was really a, a global trade, a global heritage. Many of them came around the Horn, which was very treacherous in and of itself, after they had exploited the populations of whales in the Atlantic, moved up into the Pacific, and here they were making for their new port of call, the Kingdom of Hawaii, and Maui, and Oahu, where they can rest, refit, perhaps recruit new crewmen, and then here, these darker areas you can see in this map, which was created in, on the US exploring expedition between 1838 and 1842. One of the reasons for this government expedition to go out to the Pacific was to discover the populations of whales for our American commerce. And here are those populations as they map them. And here, what we call the Japan grounds was a significant dense population of sperm whale of the, the Physitor macro, Macrocephalus. Uh, the spermaceti oil was the most prized, the most lucrative, and therefore you can see why as they exploited these groups of whales coming up into the Pacific, the ships would begin to head this direction for the grounds of Japan. And then you can understand why from those days setting out from Honolulu heading west, northwest, they would be crossing these uncharted, low, unmarked atolls. Many of them would run aground accidentally, which they did. Here's Pearl and Hermes Reef, named after the two British whaling vessels, Pearl and Hermes, that were lost there, uh, that we had a chance to survey. And remember the locations here also of Midway and Cure Atoll. So you get a feeling for what those atolls look like. These are very low, sandy, uh, basically unvegetated atolls, very barren, 
a harsh environment. And uh, on a dark night in 1822, the Hermes and the Pearl were sailing in consort, small wooden British whaling vessels looking to strike it rich and fill their holds with spermaceti oil. And the Hermes ran aground first, you know, having no indication that they were close to this atoll on the reefs right out here. The Pearl moving in to assist her sister vessel off the reef also ran aground and 57 unlucky British whalers ended up on this little island. And it was not a very friendly existence to say the least. Um, there's not much you can do other than salvage the remains of your vessel and try to survive off of albatross, fish, seals, and maybe construct a, a, uh, a, a vessel that will bring you back to civilization and affect your own rescue because 1822, there are almost no other European ships sailing across the Pacific, very rare. This is just a picture of our team back in 2002 as we're looking around for the survivor camp and some of the other pieces of the wrecks that washed ashore. Once we found the site in 2004, we began to look at diagnostic artifacts. And here are the kinds of things that tell the story for us, that help us identify that these are indeed the Pearl and Hermes whalers. Um, the bronze implements, the artifacts of, in this case, the hinge or pintle and gudgeon for the rudder, heavy bronze implements, the iron cannon. And you might ask yourself, why would whalers be carrying cannon on board? Well, if they're setting out for the Pacific in 1822 and they're gonna be gone for three or four years, they're not really sure what the political situation is going to be at any time. So they may have to protect themselves from countries that they may have found themselves you know, in conflict with. Um, the bronze, the copper fasteners, fastening the elements of the ship together, one of the wheels from the many blocks and tackle in the rigging, pieces of the gin bottles, the copper sheathing here, uh, which they use to line the hull to prevent the, all the marine creatures from fouling the bottom of the hull and slowing the ship down. It was lined with copper sheathing, which all got crumpled up like paper when it ran into the reef and dragged the wood over the coral. All kinds of implements that we call diagnostic artifacts and used to make the identification. What do 57 British whalers do when they're stuck on an island <laughs> for two or three months uh, hoping for a rescue? Well, they start building their own uh, boat for, for their, set, for their uh, delivery. It may have been called deliverance. I've seen it also called the drift. This is not a picture from 1822. This is actually a drawing made from a shipwreck from a later period that we will talk about but this is the exact kind of thing that they would have done. James Robinson, carpenter of the Pearl, took charge of the construction of building the small sloop that would take them all back to Honolulu. Um, and then the amazing thing here, one of the side notes that's really fascinating to understand is this was not unexpected for whalers at the time. A lot of these guys would have been in other shipwrecks, two, three, four shipwrecks. It was not that unusual. Uh, it was just kind of a hazard of the industry, really. But to make a long story short, uh, before they actually finished, well, when they were close to finishing the deliverance here on the beach at Pearl and Hermes, another vessel actually did come by, the Earl of Morby, and was going to take them all back to Honolulu. James Robinson and his team had put so much work into this little sloop that he said, look, captain, give us the, the sloop that we're building, the deliverance, we'll sail it back to Honolulu for you. And they did. Robinson and 11 others sailed themselves back instead of getting on the Earl of Morby to be rescued. And James Robinson and company then established the first Western style shipyard in Honolulu. Now this picture is a little later than, you know, 1822. This is about 1854. This is the Port of Honolulu though. And right here is the James Robinson Company shipyard. Here's a vessel on the ways under construction because James Robinson knew as many others also knew 
in different situations that you may or may not strike it rich as a whaler, but you're surely going to make money provisioning the whaling vessels. Because as we all know in Hawaii, what happened over time was in the 1820s, you know, two whalers show up, then seven, then 10. And then by the time we get to the heyday of historic whaling in the Pacific, for the Americans in particular, hundreds of vessels are transiting through the Kingdom of Hawaii every year in pursuit of this liquid gold, whale oil, and decimating whale populations throughout the world's oceans. So it really is an incredible legacy, an incredible story with a number of lessons for us. But the provisioning that was necessary changed the nature of the Hawaiian Islands. Suddenly the outer islands are sending agricultural products, uh, pigs, uh, coconuts, everything to Honolulu to sell to the whalers. And as my friend, Dr. Brad Barr reminded me, even the water system in Honolulu finds its origins in the need to deliver fresh water to these whaling vessels in Honolulu. Hans, really quick question from someone, and I actually had the same question. Were materials from the wrecks used to build the new sloop? Absolutely. They, they used materials from, salvaged from their vessels. They had no other source of wood. Uh, they sailed it back to, to Honolulu, and James Robinson and his team sold that boat for $2,000 and used that money to start their shipyard. Good question. So I wanna kind of continue on the provisioning theme here and the landings, the inter-island landings, because this is also so much a story of our Hawaiian islands, the, the sugar industry days. So the provisioning changes the nature of inter-island transportation. But by the time you get to about 1870s, when the Kingdom of Hawaii has a treaty with the US to sell sugar, the landowners in Hawaii realize now they have a market. Now their plantations can really take off economically. And that's when steam vessels are viable and begin to really operate in the Hawaiian Islands. And this is an image of a very typical uh, inter-island steamer. Um, we call them a, 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 a sail-assisted steamer, a, a steam schooner, really. The Cosmopolis, built on the West Coast and in service in the lumber industry there in the West Coast for a number of years, starting about 1887. Um, going in and out of all those dog hole ports up there in the Pacific Northwest, taking lumber to San Francisco to build all the houses. Um, they call them dog hole ports, you know, because these are really just tiny coves. And uh, so they said, you know, the, the cove was so small, it was about big enough for a dog to go into and turn around and come back out. That's how they got their name. But when the plantation business started up, the sugar industry starts up, these uh, steam schooners come out and are perfectly suited for inter island transportation, servicing the mills and the populations and the sugar industry throughout the islands for a number of years. And in this picture, you can actually see one of the dangerous landings that they had to operate with. There aren't many protected areas in Hawaii to actually bring a vessel close to shore. So they would have a, a wire rope come down from the top of the cliffs and the steam schooner would anchor underneath that wire rope close to the rocks. And they would lower these bags of sugar into the hold. They'd also send about you know, 145 deck passengers out that way. So if you can imagine 145 deck passengers on this steamer, uh, regulations were a little bit different back then. Let's just put it that way. So this is a very typical example of uh, a very common site for old Hawaii in the sugar industry days. And accidents happen. Um, older vessels sometimes run aground. In this case, the SS Kauai was at Mahukona Harbor, and it was actually Christmas Eve in 1913, and a Kona storm kind of came up. The winds changed direction, and the old steamer just went onto the rocks. So not a tremendous shipwreck story there, a very typical loss for an industrial hardworking vessel. They couldn't get the vessel off of the rocks. Happens all the time. And um, you know there are dozens and dozens of these steamers underwater, the remains of them around the Hawaiian Islands. 
Here's Malakona Harbor today. And this is quite a nice landscape of what the Kingdom of Hawaii's port of entry was. All the infrastructure along the shoreline for the, the boathouse and the derricks. There are actually railroad lines, narrow, narrow gauge railroad lines coming in from the other uh, mills and large tanks for the molasses they would ship on these vessels. And this landscape extends underwater, this cultural landscape of inter-island transportation. Here is the reciprocating steam engine, two-cylinder steam engine, propeller shaft and propeller of the SS Kauai. And here's a typical example of boilers that we find around the Hawaiian Islands. So this is steam technology, simple technology, and one of the big Scotch boilers originally developed in Scotland. They're called Scotch boilers. Very heavily encrusted and slowly becoming parts of the reef itself, of course. This site is actually very nice. It's easy to access. So we use it for training for uh, marine science students from the University of Hawaii. And they get to be, they get to experience the methods for surveying and interpreting underwater wreck sites. You can't make it out here so much, but beneath this coral and scattered in the sand are lots of plantation pieces because actually the SS Kauai was bringing, they had shut down a mill to the north, John Hines Mill, and they were bringing all the parts from the mill and the iron wheels for the narrow gauge uh, railway cars back to Malukona. That's what's scattered all over the bottom of the bay. And it's not just the shipwrecks themselves. I will say it's also the landings that have a very interesting history to them sometimes. The dozens of landings around uh, the islands where you can find, you know, the, the bottles and the, the winches and the cargo derricks. This is an example of a, of a cargo derrick. Here's a derrick base that's on its side has fallen over at the Waimanalo landing, uh, that mark where all this activity used to be. That was the only way to get around back then. There were no planes flying between the islands. So everyone came and went from these landings on the steamers um, at these locations. But now I want to talk about the, the naval story. Is there any question about the... Yeah. The um, somebody had asked, I think it was the, not this most recent wreckage, but the earlier one, how was the wreckage located in 2004 was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. I think that was about the atoll, but. Oh, the whaling, the whaling site, the Pearl and Hermes. Yeah, we, we knew the story. We didn't know where that site was, but NOAA divers who, doing, who are doing other tasks like bottom characterization or looking for, you know, uh, marine debris, fishing nets that drift into coral reefs and need to be removed to save the reefs actually came across some of those pieces. And we had, uh, we had shown them pictures of things to look for. And so they reported the site and we were more than happy to go out and take a look at it. Cool. One other question was, um, is this the Robinson that established the family on Kauai and Ni'ihau? Mm. I think it's a different Robinson family, I believe. But they, it's a, still a very uh, large company here in Honolulu. Do you, do you want one or two more quick questions? Sure. Um, on the inter-island steamships, what was the fuel? Wood, coal, question mark? Coal if they had it, wood if they have to. <laughs> um, another question was, how is the whale? Oh, I don't know if I want you to answer that. How was the whale oil extracted from the body of the whale? Oh, that, that's a lovely. That, yeah, maybe. They would basically bring the whale alongside the whaling vessel, skin it like you would peel an orange, and then cut the sections of blubber into huge pieces and boil them in the tripods. And the carcass and the meat they would let go and waste. It's a very, very bloody industry. Oh, my goodness. Um, and the last one, what schooners and captains moved, moved people to Kalapapa? It's kind of... Well, some of these same types of steam vessels would have done that before in the early days, they would be, you know, sloops and, and schooners in our inner island trade, but uh, steam became much more handy and efficient to use.
from about 1850, 60, 70 onwards. Now I want to talk a bit about the, the naval legacy in the Pacific because it's surprising. Uh, it is an important resource and an important legacy in history for the Pacific and for Hawaii, but many people don't realize that there's actually a civil war vessel out here in the Hawaiian Islands. And this is the story of the USS Saginaw, which is a very small steamer, a very bold steamer. It was actually built at Mare Island on the West Coast, the first vessel built at a new naval shipyard in Mare Island after Mare Island was established. Only 150 feet long or so, 450 tons. Basically a sailing vessel, but with paddle wheels and steam, steam power. So no propeller, but paddle wheels. I think the Navy would have called this a, a gunboat. So relatively small. But at the same time that they were actually laying down the keel for the Saginaw in Mare Island in California, Captain Brooks on the bark Gambia was discovering a little atoll midway across the Pacific, which he named Brooks Island. And this is one of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, midway. But it was called Brooks Island back then. And here you can see his track, his original map to describe the islands and kind of make his claim. And he even wrote on the island here, millions of, of fowl, you know, the seabirds, and a dog left on this island and a great variety of eggs. I wish I knew who left that dog because there are no earlier shipwrecks that we know of at Midway. So it's a mystery where that dog came from. But eventually the Navy in wanting to project itself into the Pacific, the United States knows that it needs to find places to stockpile coal to support its fleet. And rather than compete with the merchants for limited space in Honolulu in the kingdom of Hawaii, the Navy claims Brooks Island as US territory in 1867. And here is what Midway looks like today, of course. And we know that history of the World War II history and the Battle of Midway pretty well. This modern channel on the south side was not there in 1870. This was too shallow to go in. So uh, the Navy in 1870 had interest in making a channel through this leeward side entrance to the protected interior lagoon and anchorage area surrounded by the protecting coral reef. It would be a perfect anchorage, perfect place for a coal depot. And here's the commander of the USS Saginaw, Lieutenant Commander Montgomery Seacard. And what Midway looked like to him when he constructed a couple shacks for the contractors that he was going to supply in their months long stay, several months, these these poor guys from Boston, uh, one hard hat diver and a lot of explosives and a barren island. And uh, Commander Seacard would go back and forth between Honolulu supplying them to see if they could blast that channel open. He had been in the Civil War. He had been in the, uh, I think in the Battle of Mobile Bay. He was originally from New York and still relatively a young man. But you can see in this picture, his eyes have that kind of a uh, weary look that you see in a lot of Civil War images, young men who are actually old men. It's, it's quite striking. But he was a very good commander uh, for the last days of the Saginaw. The Saginaw vessel itself had a wonderful history. It served in China uh, during the Opium Wars, protecting Americans there. It served in uh, Mexico and the West Coast during the Civil War and the French intervention in Mexico. It uh, explored the channels in Alaska when we purchased Alaska from Russia, and then ended up on this task to see if they could open Midway for an anchorage. Unfortunately, <laughs> it, uh, it didn't work. They were unable to actually clear that channel. So we went to pick up the contractors and the hard hat diver and take them back to Honolulu and take them back to San Francisco. But before returning, after he picked them up, he did something responsible. He said, let's go to Cure Island. He called it Ocean Island then, because he knew that there had been shipwrecks over there, 70 miles away. He just wanted to make sure there weren't anyone, wasn't anyone waiting to be rescued before going home. It was a dark night. Again, these are low atolls, uh, no navigation markers, and this is probably one of the slowest shipwrecks in history because the Saginaw was just moving forward downwind, downswell, 
overcast sky, no moon, pitch black, maybe one or two knots, Very, you could walk faster than that, and it runs into the reef at Cure Atoll and gets stuck, and it's very unfortunate. And he made these drawings, these are Sicard's drawings of the whole incident. So 93 enlisted Navy men. And remember, this is from the days when it was not a glorious job to be in the Navy. So these 93 men came from about 11 different countries and spoke a plethora of languages. Uh, 93 men are cast away on this relatively barren island uh, with very little hope of rescue. And they do something that all shipwrecked sailors do at the Pacific, salvage their vessel for wood and supplies, establish their tents with sails on shore, uh, and begin to construct a schooner, a little sloop for their rescue. And they also had the ship's gig, the captain's gig, a smaller boat that was in perfect shape as well. But that wasn't big enough to save them all. They had to start building the bigger one here. But you can see their survivor camp here. They, um, they also, of course, went on an enforced limited diet of monk seal and albatross. And they complained greatly of missing sugar and bread. They were on the Atkins diet. And so they lost a lot of weight. And it was it was a difficult survival, but it was possible for the 68 days that it took them. So here is his drawing. We saw this before as an example for the Pearl and Hermes, but it's actually the drawing of their deliverance, that, as they named it, on Curie Island. And uh, also the captain's gig, which they outfitted with a new suit of sails and made modifications to. The idea was to have five volunteers sail in this smaller uh, uh, boat to possibly make it back to Honolulu, but to continue working on this larger sloop to rescue them all if that didn't work. So they took volunteers, five volunteers. Here's uh, the young Lieutenant John Gunnell Talbot, uh, who was in charge of this rescue voyage in the small gig, and the coxswain William Halford, who unfortunately was the only survivor of this voyage. It's, it's somewhat tragic. Uh, by the time they made it back to Honolulu, they were so famished and starved, they were unable to maneuver in the surf, and they, they rolled into the waves on Kauai, and four of them perished, and uh, William Halford was the only survivor, carried word to the kingdom, and then they sent the steamer to rescue the entire crew. So fortunately, everyone else lived. We knew where to look for the remains of the Saginaw from the description of the event, but we had no signal from our magnetometer in this area. Here you can see the coral reef atoll and the reef crest here in the deep water in dark blue. You can see the spur and groove topography, the kind of coral and topography, the, the radial valleys that funnel water in and out of the lagoon. And um, we just could not you know, use any remote sensing tools to find the site, so we had to dive for it in 2002 and 2003, go into these channels and look to, to, and to look and try to find the remains. And fortunately we did find the wreck site. You can see a couple of the um, cannonades here, smaller cannonades, broadside cannonades. The anchors from the bow section, this is where the bow ran into the coral reef. And this large kind of uh, amorphous looking piece of reef, which is actually solid iron, that's the chain locker. That's what happens to the ship's chain locker up in the bow. The wood deteriorates over time, and so all the chain is left in a big pile and becomes solidly encrusted. So we're looking at the bow section of this wreck, but the rest of the pieces were scattered all over the area, really large dispersed artifacts scatter. Here are the oscillating steam cylinders. Uh, very interesting. They you can see them in this sketch, this elevation sketch. There was one cylinder here and one here, and they pushed this crank around on this paddle wheel. So both of the cylinders had to kind of oscillate and rock back and forth like this. It must have been pretty exciting in the, in the engine room when this thing was really going. And some of the engine room parts in that area. And some of the bigger pieces, the solid iron paddle wheel, the large paddle wheel hub, uh, in the, the, the area where the midship section was, and the boiler face. The boiler was pushed up further onto the back reef, obviously, 
And so this is how we make our diagnosis, our identification. You know, we sketch the boiler face on the reef and we compare it to drawings from the National Archives and understand that that was the distinctive boiler on board the Saginaw. It's another piece of evidence that identifies the site. Clear quick question. question. Yeah, yeah, quick question. Where on Kauai, somebody had asked where on Kauai did the captain's gig go ashore, if you know that. Yeah, it's just a few miles west of, um, of the bay, of Hanalei Bay, on the north shore of Kauai. Yep. Here is some of that Civil War technology also that we did find. The bow and the stern of the Saginaw had these larger uh, rifled cannon, Parrot cannon. And these were some of the reasons that the Civil War was indeed so, so horrible and devastating because the tactics hadn't changed so much for the men on the ground, but the technology of things like these rifled cannon had changed immensely and these were much more powerful. And so that's one reason why the Civil War was, was such an awful ordeal um, for uh, our American history. The gig ends up still around. It's actually at the museum in Saginaw, Michigan. And you can see it preserved there. And on these hatch combings, these wooden hatch combings are the names of the five men who sailed the gig because, you know, if they hadn't made it, at least it would have washed ashore and someone would have read their names and realized what they were looking at. And in the cemetery, oh, down the street from me is uh, the, the, the grave for three of the five in the uh, no cemetery. The interesting thing about this tale, and it's, it's not many people realize it, but back in this, these days in 1870, you know, we were a relatively minor Navy. We were maybe 12th in the world power. So there was no money to get these guys home from Honolulu. So they ended up selling this gig in Honolulu to make money and, and selling almost anything else they had, the clothes off their back and raising donations just so they could get themselves back to Umer Island as they were supposed to do being in the Navy. Hans, a couple yeah. of questions. Sure. Um, somebody was wondering why the mag magnetometer didn't pick up all the iron. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. It's, it's, a, it's an art and a science using a magnetometer. But uh, one of the main reasons is because those valleys in the spur and groove topography were so deep, we couldn't tow the magnetometer underwater close enough to the bottom without having it snag the coral and destroying the, the tow fish. So we had to tow it at the surface. So it was nowhere near enough where it should have been to detect what are relatively small signatures. You know, the cannon weren't that big. Those larger parrot cannons and anchors were close enough to the reef crest itself that we couldn't have towed a magnetometer in there anyway. So we were towing in the vicinity, but not close enough. And just one, thank you. And one more question is, wasn't the rescue boat built from the Gledstains also named Deliverance? Yes, it was. And I'm glad that we have other maritime historians on the call. And in fact, uh, that, was, that was a story that uh, Sicard knew. Uh, and he may have named his boat after that boat. I don't know. I don't know if we're able to still even see remnants of the Gledstain sticking up above the coral reef. They may have, they may have been able to do that. The Gledstain site is a wreck that we found a few years later and surveyed, and that's also quite a story of, of survival and shipwreck in the Pacific. And the Good final question. question, yeah, sorry, final question was how deep was the reef and wreck? Too shallow. The Saginaw is <laughs> too shallow. Quite often we were just in the groove, spur and groove channel with breakers overhead. And so we, we couldn't be very exact sometimes in our measurements because we were just trying to hold on and not get swept back and forth um, by the surge. 12 feet, I would say. So there is quite a naval legacy in the islands. And I will mention, you know, just in terms of the amount of this type of property around here, many people don't realize there are at least 1,475 sunken aircraft in Hawaii. Of course, this is associated with a much later period of time. Um, and um, if you can see the whole chart here, you may be able to. 
This is a chart showing aircraft losses in the Hawaiian Islands from about 1922 to 1952. And you can pick out World War II years. These are the World War II years. It's such a hazardous occupation, you know, naval aviation and so new. And these are all training accidents for the most part. Uh, there's a tremendous loss of aircraft and lives, just training before operations in the South Pacific. In 1945 alone, there were some 540 naval aircraft splashed into the waters around the islands. That's, that's an average of one or two every day. That's a mark of the commitment to the cause at the time. Some of those aircraft in the islands are actually associated with the December 7th attack. Here is a PBY Catalina, a flying boat that was strafed on December 7th, 1941 at Kaneohe Naval Air Base. Uh, that's a wonderful story, maybe a presentation for another time. There are a number of amphibious vessels scattered around the islands from the training exercises that were held here, massive training exercises prior to amphibious operations in the South Pacific. This is an example of an Amtrak, an armored Amtrak. It looks like a tank, but it's actually a, an amphibious vessel. It would drive itself ashore and up onto the beach being launched from bigger ships during these operations. The story is that, uh, you know, the, the sailors were often given chocolate candy bars for seasickness and, and they would eat the bars and throw the wrappers on the deck and that clogged the bilge systems and flooded some of these Amtraks. I don't know if that's true, but it's one story that's told. There was, of course, the discovery of the Japanese mini sub uh, that was part of the December 7th attack. And this is the sub outside Pearl Harbor. And its, its mission was to sneak into Pearl Harbor and coordinate its attack, launch its two torpedoes uh, in conjunction with the aircraft that arrived the next morning. Of course, it never succeeded in that. It was sunk by the USS Ward. And as we all know, the story of the USS Arizona itself and the Pearl Harbor attack. And these are well-known stories and presentations for another time, but quite important to local, regional, and national history. But the World War II story I want to end with is something that's not as well known. It's, it's a story of secret technology. And in this case, Japanese submarines that were literally aircraft carrier submarines. We had no idea that the Navy of Japan were constructing these. We had experimented with the idea ourselves and others had. But you can see here the Sentoku I-400 class, 400 foot long aircraft carrier submarine, three of which were, were finished by the end of the war, just at the end. And in the side view, you can see the waterproof hangar, the tube, that had you know, kind of dismantled Seiran aircraft inside the tube, the sub would surface, the aircraft would be rolled out and assembled, launched, catapulted off this ramp, then the boom would be raised, the plane would land in the water and the retractable boom would pick them up out of the water, put them back in the ramp, put them back in the tube and the submarine could submerge. And these are a range of 37,000 miles. So this was, quite amazing technology. We had no idea that they had something like this. But again, too little, too late, and not enough to change the conclusion of the war. Just as the war is ending, in fact, these submarines are sent out on their first mission, the I-400 and the I-401. And they didn't even complete that mission when they received the radio transmission to return to base and the emperor had surrendered unconditionally. Um, and so the story is told that they jettisoned their ordnance, that they jettisoned the planes, and soon enough, the American destroyers uh, intercepted them, and a prize crew of American sailors went on board. And we can only imagine what that felt like, because at the same time, people are relieved that the war is over, and they may just survive this thing. But you have two enemies who have been at each other's throats boarding the submarine and taking control. It's a very interesting situation to say the least. One of the amazing stories though is actually the death of Captain Arizumi on the I-400. Uh, he had reportedly been rather notorious. He was one of the co-planners of the Pearl Harbor attack. He had assisted in the design of the I-400 class aircraft carrier submarines. 
He had uh, been accused of war crimes in the Indian Ocean. And with the American prize crew on board, he committed suicide in his cabin by pistol and was buried at sea by his crew without the Americans finding out. So that is one of the amazing incidents that you know occur over and over again in, in uh, conflicts like this. We knew the approximate location because after they had been intercepted in Japan, they were brought back by the American crew to Hawaii to be examined. Our allies at the time, the Soviet Union technicians wished to examine these submarines with us and we did not wish to share that technology. So we took them off of Barber's Point and sank them intentionally uh, by, by torpedo. We didn't know the exact location. And even though they're not technically shipwrecks because they're intentionally sunk, they're still quite interesting artifacts to see. So uh, the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab, and here's Terry Kirby, the senior pilot and operations director, and my friend Jim Delgado. Here we are launching one of the Hurl submersibles off the submersible barge to examine a sonar target, which indeed turns out to be the I-400 in about um, 500 or 600 meters of water. You can see the ramp that they launched off of here on the bow deck. The wood decking is all gone, but these frames are the frames that supported that teak decking. And over on the left side, you see that retractable, raisable boom for recovering the aircraft. And here you see this thing that looked to us like a bear rug. And we were staring at this thing going, it looks like a bear. I can see the face. Um, this is some sort of cyanobacteria growing, growing off fatty tissue. We knew that there was no loss of life on this disposal. So this is, these weren't human remains. What we're probably looking at is uh, uh, a porpoise or a seal fall, a carcass that's landed and that's being you know, turned into uh, food again by the bacteria. Here's the deck run on the aft of the deck. And this looks like a canvas shroud, but actually that's a metal hood, you know, a thick metal hood. The force of the water when this uh, large submarine was descending was so great that it warped this metal sheet around the deck gun on the stern deck of the submarine. We couldn't find the bow because the bow had actually broken off about 50 feet back. So what we're looking here at is the, the torpedo tubes, four upper and four lower torpedo tubes. These submarines were huge. They were the largest submarine of, of anyone's Navy at the time. And for many years after, they were the largest submarines that had ever been built. Eight torpedo tubes arranged vertically in the bow. And the stern, here you see the dive planes and one of the two propellers and all of these cables. These are the degaussing cables, the degaussing coils. This was new technology during World War II. Ships and submarines were wrapped in these copper coils and then electric charges were pulsed through these coils to reduce the electrical, the magnetic signature of the vessels. And that's pretty important when you're in submarine and you don't want to be operating close to magnetic mines or be detected uh, by magnetic sensors. So there's degaussing coils that when the vessel falls apart, they all get loose and kind of, we see these a lot over World War II style wrecks in the Pacific, these degaussing coils. Here's one of the four sets of 25, of triple 25 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Here's the base and here are the guns themselves. Here is the hangar for the aircraft, the Seyran aircraft. Mm -hmm. You can still see one of those aircraft at the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, the Ivar Hudson uh, Annex in Washington, D.C. And here is the, the being examined in Honolulu, that large watertight hangar and this huge door with a big triangular nose to make it more streamlined. This heavy, heavy watertight door, which you could operate with, with one hand, crank with one hand and close. And there is the door on the sea floor and the large hinge as it lays on the wreck site. Now, this is a truly remarkable image because on the bottom of the ocean, certainly 600 meters down, it's a dark world. And with our lights in the Hurl submersibles, it's like having a flashlight inside a large cave. And so we could only see por one portion at a time. We could never see anything like this. 
But my friend Terry Kirby is a wonderful artist as well. And so in his mind's eye, he then paints the wreck site itself, something that no one's ever seen. And, uh, you know, it'd be very hard to light the ocean up to actually see something like this. Here is the I-400, the bow is broken off, the superstructure is all torn away. And here's the debris field that the submarine left behind it as it plummeted towards the bottom of the ocean. And he's also marking the spot of the submarine's bell because we then went and uh, with the appropriate uh, permits and plans in place to do a proper conservation job, we're allowed to recover the artifact of the bell and bring it back to the surface, to the conservation lab, stabilize it, and it's on display at the USS Bofin Submarine Museum in Pearl Harbor now, and helps to interpret the story of these I-400 aircraft carrying submarines that we knew so little about. Any questions about all those? <laughs> Yes, and we're we're at about 522, just to let you know. Um, yeah, there's several questions. So one is, um, are there many ship or aircraft wrecks known off the east coast of the Big Island, was one of the questions, along with what is the most recent shipwreck you've explored personally? Oh, gee, the, the most recent one. Personally, I think we've been looking at a number of landing craft that are around Oahu for our training classes with University of Hawaii Marine Option Program. Um, those are quite interesting. But I will show you an image of the number of wrecks that are off the Big Island of Hawaii. Big Island of Hawaii does have a number of aircraft, significant amount, amount of aircraft wrecks. Of course, most of the divers around Oahu, are around Oahu so most of the wrecks that have been located are around Oahu, but there are a significant number around the, the east side. And um, my my email address will be will be shown at the end. And please contact me, and I'll, I could you know talk to you more about uh, the wrecks that are around the east coast of Hawaii Island. Thank you, Hans. Um, one question we received even before the presentation is this: Was the high rate of dive bomber crashes off of Maui because the early aircraft? used in the war were good at diving but not good at pulling out of the dive and the replacement dive bomber was good at both but gave pilots less training and egress from a sinking aircraft that's from captain mac <laughs> yes yes captain mac mac that's a that's a good question and i got curious about that and i've been looking at the at the database and uh you're right there are a high number of dive bombers around maui um the hell divers and the dauntless um, no Avengers there, but you know Oahu has the most losses because it had more activity. Maui is second, but Oahu has more in terms of numbers for Avengers, Helldivers, and Dauntless. But uh, I think, judging from what the pilots were saying themselves, yeah, they they didn't like the Helldiver when it came on scene, and it was harder to maneuver. And in several cases we know of, pulling out at high G was was a pretty difficult maneuver. And so that may be the reason for those numbers of held of of uh, dive bombers. Dive bombing itself was a pretty particularly dangerous tactic. But there are more Hellcats around Maui than dive bombers. There are more Hellcat fighters. So you have to take things like that into account. Okay. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, I do want to mention, uh, having talked about the bell and our recovery of the bell, that. Um, NOAA and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, we are a resource management agency. So there is a preservation side to these properties that we use to tell these stories. I'm not gonna go into detail about the laws and the acts and the, and the penalties, but we do emphasize that especially for Navy resources like this, those are still property of the federal government and there are penalties for damaging properties uh, that belong to the government and that other shipwrecks may be properties of the state of Hawaii as well. So there is a preservation angle to our message when we talk about these stories. Here is an image of our database and it's not zoomed in very closely, but you can see the color-coded positions of known wrecks in green and then the uh, lesser known and then uh, maybe very difficult to find wrecks in yellow, orange, and red. And there are 2,000 180 entries in the database for submerged aircraft and shipwrecks 
in the Hawaiian Islands. And that's what we use uh, to do our statistical analysis. Information about that database, not the database itself yet, but the narrative and the history, you can find for free at www.bome.gov forward slash Pacific dash completed dash studies forward slash. The report's called The Unseen Landscape, or you can email me and I'll send you a copy. But this talks about the context of the inventory itself. And finally, to conclude, I just want to say, I don't know about uh, Generation X now, but when I was growing up back then, because I'm, I'm certainly older now, I, I couldn't get enough of things like sea hunt and, and stories of adventure underwater. And I thought I had to be a diver of some sort when I grew up. And uh, I didn't know I'd end up actually doing it. Um, but and I didn't know that I actually wouldn't need to have an underwater fight every dive. It seemed like from Sea Hunt and uh, Lloyd Bridges as Mike Nelson, you had to learn your fighting skills underwater because it's a pretty dangerous environment. That's not exactly true. Uh, but what I do get to do for my job is a good portion of history and archaeology. And lo and behold, it ended up having an element of adventure to it. And so that's what I tell uh, audiences when I give talks in, in classrooms and, uh, and students is that, um, you know, if you're interested in something like I fell in love with history, with maritime history, just stick with what you love and, and you're going to end up having an adventure of your own. So I would say thank you very much for attending and listening to this uh, presentation. And if we have time for any more questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks, Hans. That was amazing. And we do have a couple more questions. I, I don't know if we can get to all of them, but one I thought was really interesting was someone asked, um, you had mentioned with the traditional um, Polynesian crafts, how there were their sailing vessels were more um, perhaps made for, they weren't, they didn't sink. They didn't, they didn't have shipwrecks. But the person who wrote this asked, um, wouldn't it make more sense that it's not necessarily that they didn't um, sink, but that their, their materials biodegraded and therefore you would perhaps not be able to find them the way you would be able to find things made of different materials, such as the ones you mentioned um, where you find the shipwrecks. So I thought that was interesting. So that's a good question. That's absolutely right. I mean, they don't sink like Western vessels sink with heavy ballast they needed to keep upright, the monoholes. Uh, they were catamarans, double hulls, so they didn't need that for stability. But of course, they did suffer all various hazards. And, and obviously, the, the hundreds of years spent exploring unknown areas of the Pacific, there was, we're not really sure how many were lost over time and what, what types of accidents they did suffer. So not sinking per se, uh, but if they did uh, end up underwater intentionally or otherwise. And there are places in the Pacific where people have intentionally sunk traditional watercraft to preserve them, uh, you know, for cultural reasons. Um, you can put a lot of rocks in them. Yeah, some of those woods may not deteriorate as much as other woods. The kinds of hulls we were talking about deteriorating are, are different woods that are protected by copper sheathing, but hardwoods do better underwater. And if they're covered by sediments, in an anaerobic environment, wood can last a very long time indeed. So Polynesian voyaging canoes did suffer accidents, just not the sinking that Western vessels did. Hans, thank you so much. Um, for anyone whose question wasn't answered, if we will collect the questions and we'll see, maybe Hans will indulge us in respond to them. If not, you can certainly reach out to him. He's got his email address here. It was a really fascinating talk. And um, if you want to stop your screen share for a second, I just want to put a little slide up from Historic Hawaii Foundation. Bye. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, let me see one second. Screen share. Um, I just want to say thank you, first of all, again to Hans. Um, it's just 
it's so fascinating to hear all this history and to hear the stories and especially the dog. One of my questions was going to be, what's the most unusual thing you came across in all of your studies? And for me, that was finding the dog on the island. So I'm curious what yours would be. And maybe you can share that with me after and I'll share it with everyone. Um, I really wanna just thank everyone for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. I want to thank my colleague, Michelle Kisek, who's been providing technical support. Um, ask you to stay tuned for news of our next virtual event, which is in the works, but not re yet ready for announcement. And um, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't yet at historichawaii.org. You can find the little envelope and get onto our e-news list where we announce events like this and other ways to engage with historic places. And then I um, also just wanna ask you to consider supporting HHF in our work um, via either PayPal or through the join us section on our website, which is the slide you're viewing right now. And I want you to enjoy the rest of your evening and stay healthy, stay inspired, um, stay balanced. And thank you for, for caring about history and preservation and the stories that make Hawaii so special. Thank you, Hans. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a great evening, everyone. Be well.